My philosophy is how do we move from processed foods and gradually get closer to real foods? And I think a great example of this is let's say you're snacking on like applesauce, pretty processed. It's pretty much just like sugar. It doesn't have any fiber or anything in there. And then you're like, okay, one step better would be like, what if I had one of these fruit and nut bars, these dried bars where they have like dried fruit and nuts in them? Okay, that's a little bit better. You're having like the whole pieces in there. And so I like to get people thinking on that spectrum. How do you move from more processed to less processed? And that's a really great place depending on where you're at. Gina Warfel, I'm so stoked to talk with you today about all things nutrition, hormones, weight loss, relationship to food, and so much more. Gina, welcome to the Soul Seeker Pod. Hey, Sam. I'm so excited to be here and jam with you today. Same here. So let's get straight into it. What I'd like to hear from you is how did you get so fascinated and passionate about nutrition? Yeah, it's been such an evolution for me. I, I always felt like I had this like inner pull towards like this fascination with food. And I, I was really lucky that I had parents who were interested in health and and that always led me to like this inner fascination with like, what are these nutrients doing in my body? And, but as I grew up, when I, once I was in like high school and college, I was just like a lot of people are influenced by diets and body image and all these different fads and I really wanted to know, like, what is the truth? Mm -hmm. I was that I was the high schooler who would go to the grocery store and I would buy the magazine and I'd be like, oh my gosh, on page 62, it says, this is the secret to living life forever. I have to find out what this one food is. And it would be like almonds, almonds is the answer. <laughs> and so I was just so hungry for information and knowing like, with all the information that's out there, why do a lot of people struggle and what is the answer? What is the truth? So that ended up leading me to going to college. It kind of felt like a no brainer. Once I went to Eastern Michigan university, it was like, Oh, of course I want to be a dietitian. They, they have all the answers. The dietitians know they're in the know. Right. And so I got my undergrad in dietetics and my master's in human nutrition. And I was really excited to just tell the world about everything that I learned and discovered. And when I went to school, I learned a lot about how the body works and how to read science and basic standard things of healthy eating, which was nice to have that foundation. But when I started working with people, I realized like, oh man, people are not just numbers. They're not like just calorie plans. Like I was taught, right. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't actually create the deep, deep health that like we're really looking for. And so my fascination with health and nutrition started to evolve a lot because I was taking all of those basic standard meal plans, diets, calorie plans that I was trying to follow for myself. I was trying to get my clients and they were struggling to be consistent. They were on it and then they were off of it and they kept coming back and they were full of like a lot of shame, a lot of guilt. And it was interesting. They kept coming back almost as if I was like their parent who was going to reprimand them. They were like, oh, I just, you know, I struggled. It was really hard. I didn't do it. I didn't do the thing or I did it for a little bit. I lost five pounds, but then I gained five back. I started to really question like what I was doing in, in health and nutrition. And for myself, even I was trying to follow these plans because I had this fascination with health and facts. But I also wasn't really feeling super fulfilled in my health. I felt like health was a fight. It was a war. I was trying to force this information onto my body versus really knowing how to learn what my body's communicating to me, going really deeper beyond just calories and our body's chemistry and our emotions and our thoughts and our beliefs and how all these different things actually play a role in why do we eat certain foods? How much do we eat? Why are we making certain choices? Why does change sometimes feel hard and going so much deeper than just meal plans and calories? So it started with this fascination with facts and it has evolved into some something so much deeper. Awesome. Well, thank you for providing some context. And just to rewind and go back to what you initially uh, mentioned uh, about high school and uh, like body image and going to the magazine and things like this, was it 
can you speak to a little bit more of this uh, inner struggle that you may have experienced? I mean, I'm just alluding and inferring that it, you might have had an inner struggle. Could you speak to that a bit? Yeah, my struggles have actually evolved quite a bit. And I now see those struggles as my greatest gift, because while I hated going through those periods, they taught me so much about myself in deeper ways that I love sharing with people now. But just to rewind, when I was in high school, I was very fact focused and I used a lot of fear around facts around food to really motivate me. And I was able to like maintain a good, healthy weight, but I had so much energy constantly thinking about food, planning, don't eat this, come on. And it was like, you know, it took so much energy. It didn't feel like this natural rested health. I had to wake up and think about what I was going to eat, what I wasn't going to eat, plan it out. Sometimes I, I went through phases where I would write down how many calories I was eating for accountability. And it actually just felt like this distrust with my body. And like, mm -hmm. I was going head to head at war with my body. And then as I started to get older, after leaving high school and going into college, it actually, I went through a lot of really difficult personal transitions in my life where um, at the time, my sister and I had a business together and it just, our relationship wasn't working out. And I decided to leave that business and I lost my business and all the money that I had. And I was in a serious relationship that I realized was not the right thing. And I broke up with that relationship and I ended up like cleaning the slate of like having nothing in my life. And it really put me in a really difficult period. And I noticed that it really shifted my relationship to my food in a way that I had never understood what my clients are going for, through. In the past, I was always like, you know, if you exercise and, and eat healthy, it'll boost your endorphins and you'll feel happier. <laughs> right. And I was like, they're a happy little cheerleader, but not really truly understanding that what they were going through when it felt really hard. And so when I went through this really difficult period for a while, I lost all motivation to work out and take care of myself, which was very uncharacteristic of me. I had, I wore it like it was my identity and my own brand was like, I just live a healthy life. That's what I do. And I just like, couldn't bring myself to do it. And I was like, this is so weird. I don't want to work out. And I felt very numbed out because mm -hmm. I had so much anxiety and so many uncomfortable feelings that I didn't want to feel that. I think I hit a point in my life where I actually disconnected from my body and I started to live into my mind and a lot of thoughts, but I was so afraid of my own feelings and my anxiety and what emotions were present that I kind of became numb to everything. I didn't feel my sad emotions anymore, but I also didn't feel the happy ones. And it became like this very numb, disconnected experience. And during that time, I lost a lot of connection with my body and inner drive. Um, and I actually lost a lot of weight at that time. But then as I started doing a lot of healing work with my heart and gently coming back into my body, the reverse happened for a while where I felt so much emotion and so much communication for my body. Like I could not differentiate a food craving, a hunger, an emotion. It was so confusing. I was like, I don't know what's happening in my body, but that's when I I had spent so many years distrusting my body's communication and signals that I didn't even know what was happening. I was super hormonal. My hormones were raging and I, I just couldn't tell if I was eating because I was actually hungry or if I wasn't hungry, but there was something else that was controlling my food choices and my body started to gain weight. And I felt like I was losing this, you know, control that I used to maintain so well over my health. And it was like a slippery slope. Um, so it was a really difficult period of about 10 years of going from this very intense, rigid style of eating out of fear, but then actually going through my own challenges and shifts in life that actually took me out of control with my body and feeling like something else was controlling me. And I did not understand what was happening in my body. And it actually came with a lot of shame and a lot of guilt. Cause I'm like, I'm a dietitian. I have right. the degrees. I know this stuff. I know not to eat that. I know not to eat that much. Why does it feel like something's controlling me? And so it led to a huge unfolding of like chemistry, hormones, emotions, signals for my body, um, that made it such a gift 
that the, all the, all those pain, all the pain and all the challenges, it made it such a gift because I have a deeper relationship with my body and more respect for its intelligence and its communication than I ever would have had. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing that and that numbing type feeling. I, uh, for me, it's been like a numbing depression, you know? Yeah. I, I, yeah. I talk about that a lot. So I think a lot of people listening can relate to that. And we've, many of us have been there and it is challenging. It's this art of surrender. And what I really liked about what you spoke about relates to my message of soul life balance, right? Because from the life side of it, like you said, you're a dietitian, you are into the facts, you know exactly what all of this is, but in a way, most of us are disconnected from our own spirituality or soul, whatever you want to call it, our intuition. And it seems like not to project on you, but through those 10 years, you were learning to connect with your intuition. And then that's the embodiment of soul life balance, having the intuition of how was my body teaching me and how can I combine that with my knowledge of these facts and my schooling and education of uh, yes. being a dietitian. Absolutely. A hundred percent. That's absolutely what it is. And most of my clients, they were wicked smart when it comes to nutrition. I rarely met a person who didn't know at least the basics of health. It's, it's very rare to meet someone who doesn't know the basics of health. Like we know vegetables and salad is good and healthy. And we know that pizza is not so healthy. Most people can tell you that. So they're like, wait a second. Why do I feel trapped in so much shame around my inability? And there's an invitation from your soul that is calling to you. That's like, because there's something out of alignment that you're not listening to. Mm -hmm. And I realized I was so afraid of my emotions. I disconnected from my emotions. And um, there's a book, The Art of Nonviolent Communication. And mm -hmm. he says, emotions are the language of our soul. And I think about that. How could I hear what my soul was trying to speak to me through emotion when I was disconnected from it? And so, of course, I was trying to control everything with my mind. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love that quote. Emotions are what was it? The language. Emotions are the language of our soul. Of our soul. That's Isn't beautiful. that beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it totally is. Nonviolent communication. It's an incredible book. I didn't remember that quote. Um, so to go to the basics of health, because that's so interesting. Right now, I find it so confusing on what's healthy and what's not. And it's really an age of when we're re-establishing like our relationship to foods and health. And there's so much misinformation out there and I'm not, I'm not going to get into the pandemic and all that type of stuff with fact yeah. checking and all that type of stuff. But it's, it's very confusing because one thing that's coming to mind now is like, um, uh, beyond me and whatever the other one is called, like, yeah, my understanding is that's not healthy. But when I first heard about it and I saw the founder speak in person of one of those companies, whether it was beyond or impossible, one of those two, um, I remember being in the audience and being like, oh, wow, this is incredible. I, I can't believe that. And wow, wow, wow. Right. Um, and then the more you start to learn about and unpack it, it's like, well, no, nature and animals like that is a direct source. Would you really want something in a lab, right? How yeah. can that be healthy? So what is your relationship on either that specific thing in terms of like the beyond and possible or just the misinformation, how to make sense of what's healthy and what's not these days? Yeah, I know it can get so overwhelming. It's, it's a great point. And so my philosophy is how do we move from processed foods and gradually get closer to real foods. And I think a great example of this is like, let's say you are, I don't know, like, let's say you're snacking on like applesauce and it's like pretty processed. It's pretty much just like sugar. It doesn't have any fiber or anything in there. And then you're like, okay, one step better would be like, what if I had one of these fruit and nut bars, these, these dried bars, I don't know if we want to say brands or not, but where they have like dried fruit and nuts in them. Okay. That's a little bit better. You're having like the whole pieces in there. That's probably one step better. What if we move one step even better and we ate a piece of fruit and nuts. And so I like to get people thinking on that spectrum. How do you move from more processed to less processed? And that's a really great place 
depending on where you're at, can I always think in that way? Mm -hmm. And then when it gets overwhelming, cause you're like, what's that ingredient? What's that thing? Yeah. What, it, you know, it get it does get overwhelming and you can chase that. But I think ultimately, ultimately my mind is put at ease when I know that I'm eating less processed foods and more whole foods. And then from there, I think there's this really beautiful finessing that when you get more sensitive to what your body is telling you and communicating to you, you will know what resonates with your body and what doesn't. And I think sometimes it's actually taking the information that you're learning, applying it, and then saying, how does my body resonate with that? And I was, I went vegan for like seven years and I was doing it in a really healthy way. I was trying to get all the nutrients and all the things. And at first I felt really great. And then over time, I didn't feel like I, my energy was going down, 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 down. My metabolism was slowing down. And as I learned the science, I was like, oh, wait a minute. There are key nutrients that are really important that come from meat that actually allow your cells to take the food that you eat and turn it into energy. And if you're not supplementing those key nutrients, you're actually not going to have as efficient energy production. And those are things like CoQ10, iron, B vitamins, zinc. Those are really high in meat-based foods. So, and so this might feel very triggering to some people who are very, who are thriving on a vegan diet and very passionate about it, but you need to make sure that like you're feeling really well and you're getting those nutrients. And so by the time it was like seven years had gone by, my energy was really low. I was trying to hold on to my beliefs around veganism, but it just didn't actually, my body didn't feel like it was thriving. So then I started working in fish and eggs and then I started working in a little bit meat. And now I've gotten to a place where I'm like, if I eat too much meat, I don't really, my gut feels a little bit off. If I don't eat enough, then I feel a little bit tired and my energy isn't stable. So for me, it's been like this beautiful dance of not judging right and wrong, but constantly learning, being an avid learner and then applying it to my body and picking and choosing like what feels true to me, what feels right to me. And I have, I surround myself with people who are smarter than me. You know, I love Mark. having... Yeah, I love knowing doctors who are way ahead of my brilliance that I can be like, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And no one is the end all be all, right. but they can give a lot of good insights. I find people who I trust, who um, I surround myself. I, I follow people who love research and they love knowing the answers and they don't hold on to absolutes because it feeds an ego or it necessarily feeds a brand or a product but they just, they're avid learners. And so that's who I like to learn from people just who love to learn. They don't have any ego attached to saying, what if I tried keto and I felt how it resonated with my body? Cool. I tried it for a while. It doesn't actually resonate with my body. I get too hyper-focused on carbs and, and healthy foods that are higher in carb and I just didn't like that. But my mom, she's like, I thrive when I'm in ketosis and I don't, and I have no ego in saying, well, you're wrong because that didn't work for me. Right. So let's all learn and feel how it resonates with our body and surround ourselves with people that we trust that we can learn from and gather as much good information as we can as information is always evolving. A hundred percent. And that resonates all of that, but especially with the absolutes, you know, for me, I'm always about like the spirituality and stuff. And when people are starting to talk into absolutes, I mean, that can slip through our language. In fact, like sometimes when I say things, right, but we are, there's kind of like a tone behind it where it's maybe not the words, but it's this felt thing. And it's like, if someone's speaking in absolutes and no, this is the way that's normally when my body signals to me, like, oh, I'm not going to really take that information in, you know what yeah. I mean? So yeah, in terms of the veganism and you're right, this is a hot topic, if you will, or triggering topic. And for me, after I did ayahuasca for the first time in 2019, I realized that I kind of slowed down, uh, intentionally and consciously in terms of my relationship to eating whether it be fish, meats, poultry, pork, all, all the things. I've really cut a lot of it out. And I had a channeled message in early 2021. So probably two years after that point that I needed to eat a steak. And it was like the weirdest thing, right? From ayahuasca, that was 
after after the ayahuasca you got that message or yeah, or it was less meat from ayahuasca which- so so the ayahuasca thing in 2019 um i don't remember exactly i think a part of it was just like my relationship to eating living creatures and how yeah. i wanted to redefine that and especially how i let food go bad like even this morning i threw out some chicken because i let it go bad in my fridge and i know uh, unfortunately that's a great place to be in it like financially where you can yeah. afford to do that but it also shame guilt all that type of things whether it be the other people can't don't have access to be able to throw it out or that it was a living creature like you know that comes in for me still now but back then it was really slowing down on eating uh, uh living creatures right and then Two years after that, I was at an event with Fit for Service Aubrey Marcus's mastermind out in Costa mm-hmm. Rica. And um, there was there was a channel message from a woman. Her name is uh, Zaya. I, she, I forget her full name, but she's incredible. She's absolutely incredible. Not to get into the whole thing. There's this uh, DNA activation. She does. Uh, this is getting really <laughs> woo and, and uh, star CD type stuff. That's and great. then her like call to action was to eat a steak. And I remember hearing that at the time and being like, you know, no, I don't really like eat like that anymore. And then I was like, huh, I haven't had steak in forever. And I had that steak and I really felt like grounded. and I could feel it. And that's when this all started to click. So going back to what you were saying about veganism, I've never been vegan. You know, I've tried to just kind of be more intentional and conscious, but not to that extent of going vegan. What are some of the symptoms that I know you kind of mentioned this, but just Mm -hmm. uh, to dive in a bit more for someone that is vegan, what are some of the symptoms they might be experiencing where it's like, oh, maybe it's uh, that I'm vegan and I should look into making some changes in my diet. I think one of the biggest things is energy, just because there are so many foods that can inhibit thyroid function or inhibit hormone function or not give your body the nutrients it needs. And this isn't just an idea because I eat meat, but um, if you look at what's known as your mitochondria, those are the powerhouses inside of your cells. Their job is to take your food and turn it into energy. And those mitochondria require really important nutrients that tend to come from meat. So it's really important that if you are not eating meat, you're taking some really good supplements and you're getting all those things. Typically when I run labs for people and I I can test their mitochondrial function, I can see how well is their body taking their food and turning it into energy. And usually when I get the labs back before I ask them what their style of eating is, I can always tell when someone's vegetarian or vegan because they're, they tend to be low on really important nutrients for energy production, which affects your metabolism. It affects everything else in your body. Um, and they tend to tell me that they feel really tired. Sometimes over time, they end up with actually having weight loss resistance and they, they struggle. I think that people who tend to do better with a vegan diet are actually male athletes. And the reason why is they have so much muscle that their bodies can, they can eat enough, enough vegan foods that they can actually hit those nutrient stores, but they have enough muscle to be able to burn off the carbs and still get enough protein where someone who's trying to lose weight. Sometimes that can be harder because typically a vegan diet is just higher in carbohydrates because every time you eat a protein, you're also eating a carb. So some people who just generally tend to do better with a vegan diet tend to be men who have a lot of muscle who are athletes. Um, but it just depends from person to person, but I would look out for if your hormones are not optimal, your thyroid hormones, your sex hormones, um, or you find that you're reacting to foods. Sometimes things like gluten and soy are just common food reactions that, uh, are very common among people. So, sometimes eliminating those foods, our inflammation goes away or some of our issues go away that tend to be very common in a vegan diet. So I think just not being super attached to seeing a certain style of eating as a religion that we believe that it has to be this way, Mm -hmm. but having more openness to like, what might my body be missing or needing doing some labs, doing some 
deeper digging into how you actually feel and what you might be missing. And uh, I want to ask you about your process in terms of labs and how you work with your clients uh, and blood work and all that type of stuff. But real quick, this came up for me. How does knowing your blood type play a role in your relationship to foods and your diet? That's a really very controversial topic. Okay. It's a very interesting, controversial topic. I have met some really amazing, smart functional medicine doctors who will just say there is no evidence related to your blood type and the way that you should be eating. I find it interesting that I do think that sometimes it like, oh, blood type people That's tend me. to do better. Yeah. Tend to do better with more meat where the other types, uh-huh. I think, I, I don't know the ins and outs of like what they say with the blood type diet, but I, but they say that, oh, blood types tend to have more stomach acids and do better with meat where I think a blood types or something like that, they tend to do better with um, more plant-based or things like that. Um, I personally just haven't really seen enough research, but I do think it's kind of interesting that when I ask people who do follow those types of diets, they tend to like, it seems like they tend to match, but I don't necessarily preach it because I don't really know. I don't know if I've seen enough evidence to really have a strong opinion for myself. Totally. And it goes back to speaking in absolutes and know what resonates with you. So that's totally cool. You know, if someone does feel passionate about that or wants to look into it more, they can do the research to check it out. Uh, See how your know, body feels. Yeah. And my homeopath, she was asking my blood type. This was about a year ago and, and telling me it was important based off the food types. And I don't know that. Uh, no, nah, I don't know. I know that I haven't done a good job at sticking to the suggested foods for my blood type. So I couldn't really comment on it either way, but I was just curious when you're talking about labs. So shifting gear to labs, yeah. uh, what does that look like when you work with your clients in terms of uh, how they get blood work? Is it something they go in uh, to a local place or you know, I've done the mail order kits and then they just send you the results or how's the whole process look? Yeah, I think it's really important to get more familiar with how do you navigate now labs are direct to consumer labs are becoming a big thing where they just ship you a kit to your house and then they send you the results. Um, So there's so many different ways that you can get more familiar with your body. It's kind of like different levels of biohacking. And so your first level, let's say you are like, I don't want to do labs or I don't have the money to do labs or whatever it is. You can start by actually just paying attention. How is your body communicating to you? Get really curious and sensitive without even doing labs. I bet you will notice when you eat a certain way and your energy drops or you eat a certain way. Let's say you eat like a sweet tasting breakfast and all of a sudden you have sugar cravings for the next five hours versus a savory breakfast and you feel satisfied. Like you can start to actually get, I think we um, underestimate the value of biohacking our bodies by listening to what it's telling us. And there's a lot of value in that. Your next level might be, um, a lot of people like to do those direct to consumer type labs, things that are like food sensitivities or some of the stool tests that tell you about your gut microbiome. Um, I was really hopeful that those would help give people more information. So I've actually done a bunch of them just to see how do they compare to labs you would do with me or with your doctor or something. Unfortunately, I've been really disappointed. And I think that the reason why is I think these companies, when you're not working with a practitioner, the practitioner's interpretation is incredibly important to look at all the aspects of your health, all the different markers, how they fit together what your lifestyle is like, so many different things that are important to consider to really have a good evaluation of your health. But by taking one marker and then trying to make an association that it means something about your health is probably not a very reliable information. And so I think to protect themselves, a lot of companies keep it very generic, but they make it seem like you're really biohacking and you're knowing your body inside and out. So like when I did when I did Viome, I was like, so many people are saying like, you know, exactly about your gut microbiome and what's happening in there and these associations. And you know, exactly what is happening in your gut health. And when I got the results back, I personally was really disappointed. I was like, oh man, like (laughs) this is so it's very general. And I think they do that to protect themselves. Um, so that they don't get sued by 
an AI system saying that this equals this disease or this equals this deficiency. So I would say if you're kind of like in that place where you're like, oh, I'm kind of curious, like I want to see what might come up with my results or some changes I could make. They're fun to do. I wouldn't expect it to really change your health around if you're really having health issues. Um, And then the next level is like your basic lab panel. Everyone should be doing this with their doctor and getting familiar with what do some of these numbers mean? And so that might be, you know, you go to your doctor and you're like, hey, give me everything that you can possibly cover under my insurance. And sometimes some doctors are better than others. They'll give more information. But I think it's important to start learning what do your lab numbers mean? Because what is important is that doctors will look to see if they need to diagnose you with a disease. That's their job. Do you have a disease? Do you need a medication? A lot of the time when you go in for your 15 minute doctor's visit, they're not observing where your labs are moving in the wrong direction and then giving you the deep lifestyle strategies that you need to really make sure it's back in check. A lot of them just say, you're still in range. We'll check on you next year or we'll check next time. And unfortunately, that means you're already in a disease state if it's moving out of range. So I think it's great to feel empowered with your health, get as many lab markers as you can and start actually keeping an eye on them, track them. Which direction is your cholesterol going? Which direction is your blood sugar going? So that you're not just like, oh, ignorance is bliss until I have a disease. Um, So then just the kind of the next layer deeper is the way that I work with people, um, with my clients, is we go really deep into what are those foundational labs. But we also do labs that a doctor typically doesn't test for because I'm not looking it's, that's the different role that I play. I don't diagnose anyone with a disease that's not in my scope of work. So that would be something that maybe you go to your doctor for. But I'm looking for trends of like, how can we maybe look at what styles of eating might be good for you and do that based on your labs and your data? Maybe what nutrients are missing or low that might help support your metabolism, like we talked about, getting those cells working better, getting your hormones optimize. So you feel better, your energy is better, your metabolism is better. So that's the way that I work with people. And it just kind of depends on um, what lab tests we're doing. It's all really individualized, but typically I have um, either a test kit just sent to my clients and they just do it at home and ship it in. Or if we do like a, a bigger panel, they all schedule for someone to come do the blood draw right at their house and collect their data. And then they send it to the lab and And then I, I work the way that I work with people is dialing in everything that they need based on their data. So when you work with people to dial that in, uh, in terms of their needs, like we talked a little bit about how diets struggle to work and you know, how there's different ones and to listen to your body and make changes when you work with a client and you give them like a new path forward, how do you really craft it? So it's going to work for them. It has so many different factors. There's a lot of things that I look at. So I don't just give people facts because facts tend to like fall flat. Some people are motivated by that. I do give them information, but I like to go a little bit deeper into why are they struggling? Because our bodies were built and designed to want to crave healthy, natural foods. We want to move. So if we get off track and our bodies are out of alignment, we're gaining weight or we have inflammation or we, our bodies, we're, for whatever reason, we're not eating those foods. There's more to explore there that a plan, handing somebody like a piece of paper that has foods and recipes on it, rarely does that actually create a transformation because it's like, it's like you're trying to force something from the outside in. And then it's like, those things are in alignment. There's a reason why that person is not choosing health. And then you're trying to force health and there's this friction and it feels hard. So when I used to do it that way, when I first became a dietitian, people felt that friction and that resistance. And I felt that it was like, why does health not effortlessly flow from the inside out? So if we actually remove all of the barriers that are in the way of health, then they can actually use the knowledge that I give them and apply it from this inside out kind of way that's more effortless. So sometimes that might be something like your own beliefs. Maybe when you were younger, 
you struggled with dieting and you struggled with your food cravings and your sugar cravings. And because that is all the evidence that you have, that that's what you're capable of. Your brain is identifying with, I'm a struggling dieter. I struggle with these cravings and our behavior follows whatever we believe is true about ourselves. Mm -hmm. So sometimes if we actually just shift the belief and we start looking for new evidence that something else could be possible, and we actually just focus all of our attention and our energy on creating this new identity that supports a bigger vision of what you want, the behaviors start shifting from the inside out and they kind of become their own research project. And they're like, oh, you know what I noticed? Hmm. You know, I'm the kind of person who I'm learning about my health and I'm evolving and I'm changing every day and I'm learning how to communicate with my body. And then they start doing those things. And so then they start picking those foods that are, you know, based in science, but they're applying it from their body in a, in a whole nother way. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I keep coming back to soul life balance. It's the bridge, right? Uh, and it makes me think of uh, Joe Dispenza, Dr. Joe Dispenza's work too, kind of yeah. like bringing uh, mindfulness essentially into your diet and nutrition. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what it, what it really is. And if you have felt out of alignment with yourself, like if you're like, man, how did I get here? This doesn't even feel like my own body anymore. I don't even feel like I have control over my food choices. I don't even know why I'm eating the way that I do when my mind wants me to do something different. That is like, to me, that's like the soul is speaking to you. Like, Hey, there's more to discover. There's something I'm really craving. That is so much more than the cookies that you don't have control over. There's something I am craving and longing for to be seen and to be experienced so our health, it's fun when we start the conversation, like what's the best diet? How do we eat healthy? But really that's just like an open door to look deeper and hear like, what is our soul really communicating to us that we've always been seeking, which tends to be more listening and more self-trust and just more connection with honoring our bodies and why, and understanding why are we not honoring our bodies? I love that. And what about like when we get off track or in the moment, like practical stuff, because like yesterday, for example, um, I was with my partner's daughter and it was just her and I, and I took her, uh, to get dinner and she's five. And when we went there, she decided that she didn't want that place anymore. It was a Greek place. She's Greek. And, you know, I was like, okay, we're here. And I already asked her if she wanted pizza, you know, whatever. She's like, no. And I obviously know that's not good, but whatever. Um, and she said, no, the pizza. Then when we got there, she said she wanted pizza. I'm like, okay, well, we're here now. I know you like Greek food. So we're going to get this and not in that way, but you know, essentially then she didn't really like it and whatever. So I was like, all right, fine. We'll go get pizza. And then I was like, all right, well, I've been eating a lot more pizza now since I've been around them, right? Because that's kind of like, you know, kid diet, whatever, even like cheat meals, whatever. And I'm like, I already ate, I'm not going to get a slice. Then I go there and I'm like, all right, I succumb to it, craving, and I eat it, even though I was playing not to. So what type of practical type stuff would you recommend for situations like that, especially people that uh, have kids. And I, it seems like when we, when you're with your kids, things like that, it's easier to some come to the cravings and things like that, or just every day on the go, busy with work and having quick meals and whatnot. Uh, what are some practical tips you would have? The most important thing to remember is that this is not about eating perfect all the time and always getting there, but about you always being in choice and feeling good about your decisions and your choices. So whether you decide, Hey, I want to eat the pizza today. It comes from a place of empowerment and pause where most people get in trouble is they're running on automatic and these autopilot cycles that are just, well, I've always done it. So they just grab and they're like, man, I didn't really want that. They grab, man, I didn't really want that. This isn't honoring me. So how do we pause and like break that autopilot cycle? And the first piece to really doing that is getting crystal clear on like, okay, let's say you, you decide I don't want to eat the pizza, but the pizza is really good. The pizza is easier. It's more convenient. Your vision and your deep why for not having the pizza has to be greater than the pizza or else the pizza wins. 
Mm -hmm. So most people have never taken the time to just stop and really connect with themselves and say, why does this matter? Why do I want it? And for me, like, I don't eat perfect. I love indulging sometimes, but the difference is I used to not let myself and I didn't feel in control. Now I can like indulge and I can move on and I can eat healthy 80% of the time because my why pausing and like reflecting, do I really want this? Will it make my body feel good? For me, my why is like, there is no better feeling in this world than when I feel like I have my own back and I trust myself and I connect to my body. And so sometimes it's not eating perfect, but my why is really big. And if it's something that I'm like, eh, I've been eating too much pizza or I could take it or leave it or you know, it's just an automatic for me to find the power in pausing and being like, wait, am I choosing myself right now? Is my why for how good it feels when I honor myself and I take care of myself and I nurture myself, I can connect so deeply to what that feels like. I can meditate on it. So usually my, um, when my clients are trying to change and they're breaking that autopilot habit, they're spending pretty much every morning connecting to their deep why and their vision of what feels so good when they're nurturing their bodies or taking care of themselves. And they that vision is so big that it's at the forefront of their mind. So instead of autopilot grabbing something, they're pausing and they're connecting with that feeling of like, what does it feel like when I take care of myself and when I choose myself? And sometimes it feels like choosing yourself and the healthier thing is harder And it takes more effort to cook and to shop and to do all the things. But when I ask people and I'm like, what does it feel like when you take the easier path? And you're like, well, this is convenient and everyone else is doing it. And they're like, oh, I feel heavy. I know I'm not taking care of myself. It doesn't feel good. I'm like, what does it feel like when you take, put in the extra effort to grocery shop, to take care of yourself and say, you know what? I'm actually going to make this choice instead. You feel expansive and light and you feel so good. And it almost feels effortless. So I think the biggest thing is like, if you're struggling to make that choice, is the why for making the healthier choice, is it bigger or is there actually more value that's being put on the pizza? Maybe you're in a time in your life where pizza just actually dom- the convenience dominates the effort. And it doesn't mean that one is right or wrong, but it means let's do a side-by-side value. There's a, there's a reason why we're choosing the pizza versus making salad and let's make a strong case for the why of why would you choose a salad instead and just also in addition to that sometimes beyond just the vision and the why we're also being driven by our food cravings which is driven by your stress hormones so if you're going 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 and you're living in your head that's releasing your stress hormone cortisol its job is to get you to make less healthy choices and eat more of it because it's kind of a survival mechanism. Like, so if you've been going, 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 and you're kind of stressed and your body's releasing stress hormones, it drives you to eat carbs and sugar. It controls those food choices because that's quick energy for our survival. So when we can actually calm our bodies, most of my clients find that when they just use their breath and they calm their nervous system, and they connect into their body, then they have this moment of pause and they're just like, oh, wait a second. Maybe this isn't the choice that feels the most empowering. And they get that, they just get that moment to pause and have that reflection. And the salad isn't the right answer. The pizza isn't the right answer. The right answer is not being controlled by any decision, but extending the pause and asking is, does this align with my why? Is this what I really want? Would this feel like the most empowering choice to me? That's so helpful. I love how you bridge the gap between mindfulness and our relationship to the foods we put into our body. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. So we have a little bit of time left. So as we do, uh, we're, I'd like to switch gears and talk about hormones for a bit. And, you know, as I've been diving into my own uh, testosterone levels and things like that. I found there's a lot of myths out there. So whether it's testosterone or, you know, estrogen, just hormones in, in general, what are some myths and truths you've come across in your journey? I think one of the biggest things is that, um, when people look at their hormones and their hormones are off, they chase the hormones and they're like, what will bring my progesterone up? 
what will bring, what, how can I do, 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 like, and there are some supplements or some ways of eating that can help adjust hormones. But one of the most important things to know is that what happens upstream is far more important than looking at that one hormone in isolation. So when your body is releasing cortisol, that stress hormone, think about that as like the most important thing. Survival is the most important. So you have your survival, your stress hormones, and then you have your reproductive, your sex hormones, like your testosterone, your estrogen, your progesterone and survival and reproduction are two opposite things. So if your body is in survival and re and releasing stress hormones, it will shut down your other hormones because if your body, especially for women, if your body is not safe to reproduce, it's going to shut down reproduction. And that was a big part for me was, um, my hormones were so messed up. I had lost my menstrual cycle for a year and a half and I was, and my hormones were like non-existent. My, I went to my doctor and they're like, Ooh, it's kind of like, you're almost menopausal. Like you have no hormones in your body and you're in your twenties. You're probably going to have to start supplementing hormones. And I was taking all these supplements and doing all these things. And it might've helped a little bit, but what really helped the most was learning how to get my body out of that survival state and lower my stress hormones so that my body could switch back into that reproductive state that makes more of the hormones. And there's an abundance of research that shows that for men, one of the main contributors to converting testosterone to estrogen is stress. Mm -hmm. Also sugar, alcohol, lack of sleep, lifestyle things. Those, those also affect hormones. The same for women too imbalanced blood sugar, stress, lack of sleep, uh, certain, certain unhealthy processed foods will affect hormones, but hormones aren't just a one thing in isolation that it's like, eat this thing. And then this will happen. It's like, why does your body shift out of a state where it feels safe enough to reproduce? Right. What's happening. And most people will find that they're either really stressed, or they're not nurturing their bodies the way that they need to. And when they bring everything back into alignment, the hormones shift. And mine were absolutely a case study of that. My hormones are now up in a really healthy, good range. And originally my doctors were like, oh, you're gonna have to take hormone replacement and everybody's bodies are different. But I think it's a great place to start is why before we just replace hormones, why are our bodies not making enough of them? And things start to slow down as we age later in life, but especially if you're in your twenties or your thirties and you notice that your hormones are shifting, do some more digging, do some more exploring. Yeah, is it stress? Uh, there's definitely a lot of chemicals in our environment that suppress our hormones. That's absolutely true. Um, plastic, plastic is an endocrine disruptor. So like BPA, if you're drinking out of water bottles, if you're using plastic Tupperware, it looks almost identical to our hormones, but it doesn't act like a hormone because it's not a hormone. So what it'll end up doing is as we absorb these compounds into our body, it'll bind onto our hormone receptors and block your hormones from working. So you might even get your hormones tested and you have plenty of hormones in your bloodstream and your doctor's like, no, you're fine. That's yeah. just a... You're, you're actually fine. It's all in your head. But if you have these endocrine disruptors that look like your hormones and they're blocking your receptors on your cells, and now your hormones can't get into the cell and act and create the response in your body like it should, that's, that's a problem, right? So I think it's um with hormones, it's so many different factors and we can talk about, you know, if there's, if there's any specific hormone questions you have, but Ultimately, we have to sleep for our hormones to be in balance. You need good sleep. You need your blood sugar really stable. So not eating a lot of processed carbohydrate foods, but good blood sugar stability, um, uh, keeping stress hormones in check, noticing your nervous system. When is it activated? And that's what suppresses our sex hormone production. It, it's really, it's such a holistic 
healing process that you have to consider everything. Absolutely. And your, your experience with yourself, your clients, uh, colleagues, research, all this type of stuff, when one is going down the path of uh, improving their hormones holistically, as opposed to like TRT for men or whatever mm -hmm. it be for women, I don't even know the equivalent, but it doing it holistically, how long of a process would you say it typically would take? Are we talking about like a matter of months or a couple of years? Yeah, it just depends. And some people have there, it's not to say that there isn't a, a place for hormone replacement. For some people, there is a place for hormone replacement and those benefits way outweigh not having enough hormones in your body. I don't want to say that everyone can reverse their hormone issues and come to a good place. Um, but I think that it's really important that if your hormones are low and you're not older or elderly, getting down to the source of why, otherwise you're kind of masking you're putting like a bandaid on, on a problem. And so it depends on where your health is starting from. I have some clients who are significantly overweight and their blood sugar is so high and they need to get there. They need to really spend maybe a year or two years really working on getting their health back to a good place before their hormones really start shifting. Some people can actually just correct a few things. I mean, for me, I would say it, for me, going from very severe hormone issues to normal levels, it probably took me about two or so years, but I was figuring things out. I was trialing and erring, you know, figuring out what my body needed. So it's like, how fast can you figure out why are your hormones being suppressed? Do you need to do some detoxing? Do you need to support more nutrients that are low that actually help produce hormones? A lot of our hormones are properly um, detoxed and converted in our gut. Does your gut need support? So I wish I had a very simple answer. Yeah. I wish I could say six months. If you take this supplement, everything will change. <laughs> but sometimes there's some trial and error with like, what is the supplement that might work for you to support your body? And how diligent are you about taking care of your body, about getting enough sleep, um, about, but your body can start changing, right? Like mm -hmm. we can change our stress hormone levels in an instant. You can start breathing different and your stress hormones will go from a state of fight or flight to calm. Now, how could that start shifting your body's chemistry and your physiology? So I would say don't underestimate the power of like actually every little thing making a difference and starting to take action and be patient and gentle with your body at the same time. And if things aren't changing, maybe just looking at it as a way of there's more I have to learn about my body. There's something, whether there's certain nutrients that are missing and I'm not making enough hormones, right? Like men need enough zinc to make enough testosterone. We need stress to be at a good level. We need a healthy gut to make these hormones. Um, we got to make sure that we're not getting a ton of plastic in our environment. And then there are certain supplements that can help. Resveratrol is helpful for men and testosterone. Um, there's a, bunch what was of that one? Resveratrol is one compound. How do you spell that? Is Res, that R oh geez. It's R -E -S. R -E -S. Yep. R I, I wasn't sure. Uh, R-E-S resveratrol. V-E-R. Yeah, I'll, I'll find it. I'll put show notes. Yeah, I have not heard that one. Yeah, so I, I, I believe the, I believe the mechanism of resveratrol is, it's a, I believe it's an aromatase inhibitor, which means it blocks the enzyme that converts testosterone to estrogen. So let's say you did some labs, and you were like, okay, do I need to support my body's production of testosterone, or am I making enough testosterone? but my levels of estrogen are really high and I need to block that conversion or are my levels good enough, but I feel like I have deficiency and maybe I need detoxification because my cell receptors are being blocked mm. by plastic. You see what I mean? Like yeah. the more information you have, the more digging you can do. And so sometimes that might be through your own exploration. It might be having a practitioner that can help you navigate that, but it's not always as simple as like, here's the thing. Here's the answer. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's been a struggle with me personally, which is why I ask, cause I go to Kaiser and I do uh, blood work and they're like, 
you're fine with testosterone. I go with a holistic person there. You go, your levels are extremely low. Very different, right? Yeah. And this was what I was talking about with the myths and truths, because I personally am not the biggest believer in traditional Western medicine. And part of that is from my own experience, because when I go to Kaiser and I get my uh, blood work done, everything's good, right? When you go to my testosterone specifically, if you look at that, In our current range of healthy testosterone, I am in that range. Mm -hmm. If you look 20 years ago of where we were, I am very deficient. So if I want to be average where the average person is sick, then Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm in a healthy range as I've uncovered this more through working with a homeopath um, a, a hormone company out of Austin, Texas, where you happen to be right now, uh, ways to well, and, hmm. uh, you know, ways to well, you know, Brigham. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. Uh, I can connect you with Brigham there. And, cool. um, yeah. And then a local, uh, dietitian as well. Like I've had all these different people I'm yeah. working with and still, it's very, it's been very Everyone confusing. has their own opinion. But then taking it uh, a step deeper, I don't even remember at this point how we uncovered it, but um, I think it was my luteinizing hormone levels were, yeah. there's something with my, uh, what was it, LH, um, mm-hmm. where it didn't make sense with my testosterone. And they're like, you need to get an MRI. Then going through the hoops of trying to get approved for an MRI in California was a nightmare. When I eventually did, uh, was able to get the MRI, they uncovered that I have a tumor in my pituitary gland. And then when they looked at that, it's benign. And then there's all this other stuff. So it's like, okay, I could have just gone to Kaiser, but like, oh, I'm good. Right. But then now I'm looking at all these other things and now I'm, yep. uh, so yeah, I, I really, uh, yeah, I'd encourage people to look into all this stuff and not just yeah. take that face value for sure. Absolutely. Cause I think most of the people I work with are like, my doctor said, everything was in normal. My doctor said everything's normal, but I don't feel something isn't right. Like something right. is off. And I just want to encourage you, like keep being your own research project and find that next person who is like giving you this little, I think of them, maybe the little angels, maybe the little breadcrumbs, but they're that next thing on your journey where you're like, oh, maybe they have something for me. Maybe they have something for me. And you're doing this constant exploration. And maybe for you, maybe you find that, um, maybe there actually just is, maybe that's what the physical thing is that's keeping you from making enough testosterone. And maybe you're a good candidate for it. And then you find somebody who you really trust, who's going to monitor your levels and they're going to take very good care of you. And they're going to be like, perfect. We dialed it in. Everything's great. You know? Um, but not just taking that, just these blanket things of like, it's all in your head. You're fine as an answer, because there's probably more to discover. And at the end of the day, it's like, no one will really care as much as you do. And if you really care about knowing your body, it's like, you keep looking for answers and being your own research project until you figure it out. Yeah. I I think that's a good place to kind of bring this to a pause and I'll say pause because we definitely uh, should continue the conversation. I'd love to, because there's so much to unpack here. We just start to scratch the surface on hormones, but yeah, truth is like what you said, really do those small things first, look at yourself as your own research project, just to kind of wrap this all up. Is there any final messages you would leave people with as it relates to their health? Yeah, I think that trying not to get too (laughs) overwhelmed with all of the noise on like, this is right. And this is wrong. And just slowing down and listening to like, what is your body telling you and taking that information and giving yourself permission to like trust your body's wisdom and how it's communicating to you. And then at the same time, like just keep moving towards more real foods and then trying things and and really listening to your body. Um, You'll learn so much. You can learn so much by building trust. I mean, the relationship with your body is the longest relationship you'll ever have. So start investing in that time with it. And it can be, health can be a beautiful experience when it comes from the inside out, instead of trying to force and have anxiety from everything from the outside in. And if you are struggling to build those new habits or change things, 
exploring like, what's my resistance against it? What's the value that I have that I'm building from not being healthy? And that might unlock a whole nother deeper journey. (laughs) That's so true. And I love that you said that the relationship to our body is the longest relationship that we'll have. Uh, Last night, I started reading Living Untethered. Most people are familiar with Michael Singer's book, Untethered Soul. So he's got a new one. I don't know if you noticed, but it came out this year called Living Untethered. And How I was is reading, it? it? I love it. It's so cool. good. I'm, I'm like 50 pages in still the beginning. But one of my the age old questions for me, I remember was coming home from Sunday school one day, I'm Jewish coming home from Sunday school and going to my dad asking him if God created us, who created God? And, you know, he was like, that's the age old question. And that's something that I've always wondered, like the source of existence. And in the book, he talks about the big bang theory and then he gets deep into the science and everything. And then kind of like what existed before that. And it's way over my head with atoms, neutrons and all that. I don't understand all that. I'll be the first to say that, but it was interesting reading that. And then he was talking about how we are stars, like our body in this planet is made from stardust. Then he was like, I forget exactly what he said, but it was something along the lines of how, like, that's who our body is, but who are you inside? Right. Mm -hmm. So it's really, he's got a great way to talk about consciousness and witness observer state and all that type of stuff. So if anyone's interested, definitely check that out. But Gina, thank you so much. I appreciate the time and so many great tips here and so much more guys go to the show notes to connect with Gina, her websites, their Instagram, her programs, everything else. I'll have mm-hmm. a link to, I can't even pronounce it, but I think it was resistro. Res- how do you say? Uh, resveratrol, yeah. Res- I, I can, I can t- text you so, or send you some recommendations of what might be helpful. Please do. Re- I'm looking at now. Resveratrol. I, yeah. yeah. It's hard word to say. It's funny because being a podcaster, I've been podcasting for five years now and I used to say, want to say cognizant in, uh, uh, during a recording, but I would never use that <laughs> word because I wasn't sure how to pronounce it. So then once I looked up how it was spelled, I was like, oh, now I get how to pronounce it. But yeah. this word resveratrol, like if you look it's at it. It's a weird it, word. Yeah, for sure. It it's doesn't seem, it seems like there's something missing and it's, yeah. Well, anyways, Gina, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Oh, thanks so much. So awesome to be on, Sam. Mm-hmm.